From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Southeastern Massachusetts leaders say they often feel like an afterthought on Beacon Hill, but not this week. We're really thrilled that this is our first trip outside uh, of, uh, of the office after getting sworn in uh, to the South Coast, a region that means an awful lot to both of us. Newly inaugurated Governor Maura Healey made UMass Dartmouth the destination for her first official event away from the State House. Among those on hand to welcome Healey, New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell. What message did the new governor hear from the leader of our region's second largest city, and when will Mitchell make a decision on whether to see re-election this fall. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guest this week, of course, is New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell. Mayor, good to have you back in the program. It's great to be back, guys. Yeah, welcome. Um, so, as we said in the open of the show, Governor Maura Healey's first official visit outside of Beacon Hill was to the South Coast, a region that, I mean, I don't have to tell you, it often feels like a an afterthought, you know, uh, from Beacon Hill. Uh, what did you take away from her visit? Is it a sign to you that the South Coast will finally potentially be a priority? I hope so. It certainly sends a good signal that her first visit outside of Boston was to Greater New Bedford, right? And it's in uh, at UMass Dartmouth in particular, and um, and. You know, it's really sort of, to my mind, a logical extension of the really strong relationship that, that I have and that we in the, in the region have with her. And so it certainly brings us high hopes that, uh, that our priorities will be, you know, given their, you know, their full due. Um, there's, there's a lot going on in, in the New Bedford area right now, whether it's, you know, offshore wind and uh, arriving just in the, in the next few months or the, the changes in commercial fishing. Lots of other issues going on. Stuff I'm sure you guys will get into in this yeah. in the show, uh, but but uh, the fact that um, that she's there signals to to us, frankly, that that we, that there's a strong partnership lying ahead. It seemed to me you made quite the political investment with uh, Maura Healy. When I recall the last time you were on the show, uh, you had. Uh, Governor Baker was coming to New Bedford. So was then Attorney General Laura <laughs> Healy, and you. And I think we have video of it. You took a boat ride. Uh, you chose Healy over Baker. It's basically, if you boil it down, uh, and you and, and Maura Healy took a, a, a boat ride that day. Um, is this causing? And not, not only that, but we photobombed his. Press you did. Well, here it is. Here's the video. There we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a, a, amphibious photo bombing right there. <laughs> it was very <laughs> memorable. Uh, is this cause and effect? I mean, do you, it, it, you know, this sort of investment that you made uh, with, you know, the, the candidate for governor, now governor, is, is that why she was there? Well, I, 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 I'd like to think so, right? Uh, so, you know, she and I go back a long ways. We were in college together. And, oh, I didn't, know, I didn't that. know that. Yeah, she was a year behind me in college, and we knew one another a little bit then. Sorry, where did you go to school again? It's a little place in Cambridge. Oh, that place. Yeah, you yeah, know, no which, yeah. which won't be named, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so but, she, but we go back a ways, and... Did you actually know each other in college at all? Uh, just a little bit. Oh, just, funny. just a little bit. She was, she was the point guard who on got the better basketball grades? team. I'm sure she did, uh, <laughs> no doubt. And who was better at basketball? <laughs> I, I've heard definitely, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, uh, but no, we have, we've had a good relationship and, uh, you know, similar career paths, you know, public sector lawyers and also in the, uh, lawyers in the private sector and big law firms and all that stuff, right? So, so she and I, I think, are like-minded in a lot of areas. Um, I think she is sort of constitutionally driven to compete, uh, which is what we're trying to, uh, to, to uh, a sentiment that we're trying to cultivate locally. I mean, we see, especially in the case of offshore wind, that we've, there is a whole lot of investment lying out there, but we've, we have to be really, we as a city, as a region, have to compete hard for it. And that's what I've tried to impress upon her. And she's, on that score, she is a very receptive audience. And in fact, I mean, as you heard, Ted, at, at the event, that's, that's the way she th sees things that, you know, uh, offshore wind isn't just about climate change, as important as that as that is. Uh, for us, it's it's an economic development opportunity, but it's not one that is just suddenly going to just happen without our exerting ourselves. And I know uh, from covering politics a long time, when you have the governor or someone like or the president comes to town and someone you're in front of them for a few minutes on your own, that can be an important time to to pilot something. Did you have? I know you got to a little FaceTime with her right. as she was at this event. Was there anything specific you said? 
this is coming up, Gov, and like this is really important to us. Or anything, or is it more just a hi, how well, are you? I've had those conversations with her over over many mm -hmm. years, right? And you know, and she had some role as Attorney General in some of these efforts, right? Sort of on the margins. Now she's governor, and now she's in the thick of it. Um, but you know, we've we've gotten to a point where she understands the, the issues, and she's got strong members on our team who also understand issues that are important to us. And so when you have those conversations, you know, there is there's a sort of a um, mutual, there's a set of mutual interests you have to address. She's trying to get out of the gate. She wants to see some wins. You know, we are in a position, uh, political wins. We are um, in a position to help her deliver those wins, whether it's in the, for instance, in the construction of port infrastructure, um, yeah, or on land, the, the, the development of EV infrastructure, electric uh, vehicle infrastructure, things that advance your climate agenda. I just use those as two of what are many examples. But but that's you know we we want to be in a position to help her because if if we are, she'll be able to help us. So let's talk about. It. So she was this event at UMass Dartmouth. You and I were both there. Was climate sustainability was kind of the round table topic, and of right. course that meant a lot of talk of offshore wind, which is a big priority both in Greater New Bedford and in Rhode Island, all across our TV market really. You know, and I, I said this to you the other day, but I want to have the conversation here on the air. I'm sure there are viewers who think, I feel like every time Mitchell's been on with them for ages, it's been offshore winds coming. It's going to be big. It's going to be huge. Yeah. Where are we now in terms of seeing kind of brass tacks, the, the, what you've been promising and hoping for your entire mayorship, really, right. in terms of the construction of these big offshore wind farms and see, getting that jolt economically in the city? Right. It's been sort of a weird thing. It's been sort of like this waiting for a Godot exercise. <laughs> like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And so people, you know, but people... People aren't seeing it and the good news is that they're about to see it so Vineyard Wind just last week or it was two weeks ago just started its lease at the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal so it is a paying tenant on the New Bedford waterfront now and will be for the next 18 months I think it is well it's, it's more than a year and then uh, in they're projecting either in April or in May it's hard the, the dates moving by a matter of weeks they, they, we will start to see uh, components, uh, wind components showing up on our waterfront. And that will be uh, a, a really important moment because it'll be then that people will see these massive objects that they haven't seen anywhere before that are much bigger than the Because I don't know if people understand how, how very, very large these offshore wind uh, turbines are supposed to be out there in the, in the yeah. water. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the blades themselves are longer than a football field, and there are three of them, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. And so just for instance, right, and the, they sell, right, the hub, the turbine is you know bigger than a school bus so it's the, these things and they weigh an awful lot and when people start to lay eyes on this they'll say I hope they'll say oh that's what the mayor's been talking about all this time. and the, the the people that work on these the jobs for, they're very specialized jobs that work on these wind turbines across the country we're seeing you know the labor market is very difficult right now are there enough bodies to fill those jobs right now and are they the skilled workforce it, and actually, I guess the question is, are they coming from New Bedford? Yeah, for, so that's, 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 that's a big challenge. So initially they won't, right? So some will, and we want to push as many folks from New Bedford into those positions as possible. We, you know, we think it's un, it would be unreasonable for us to assume that, that the, the wind developers uh, or their major contractors would hire people who aren't qualified. So we want to make sure they get into the training programs that are being developed. Bristol Community College is a, will open in the next six months the country's first offshore wind training facility. Um, we're looking forward to seeing that open up. That'll be a big help. But as we saw, as folks in, in Europe saw early on, especially in the UK, uh, there weren't enough people to, to fill out all the jobs. A lot of in, in the UK, which was late to the offshore wind game, compared to Germany and Denmark, they had to import a lot of uh, workers from, from those other countries initially. And then the labor market started to catch up. But uh, I, I just, you know, I, I don't want people to think that you know, all those jobs are going to be filled by folks from New Bedford right out, right out of the gate. We want we want to promote that as, to the greatest degree possible. But there's there's going to be sort of a I do think, a, didn't you a, tweet a, a picture this week of a, a job fair that had a bunch of people going? Yeah, there? yesterday I did. Yeah, I was I w it, it exceeded my expectations. There were I don't know what the number was. But it looked busy. It was busy, and people were actually lined up at the door to get in. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there were safe to say hundreds of people who showed up for it, and so it was. It was 
and that, that wasn't the, the first uh, uh, show of its uh, type, job fair of its type. So there have been there have been a few, and so we're starting to see the momentum now. And it's not to say all those people are going to get hired, but the more people we can get into that pipeline, especially into the training programs, the better. The more likely they will get hired. Just real quick, and last thought on it. Uh, and Mayor, we've talked about this before, but you know, you want to be the number one fishing port in the country, as well as the number one wind energy hub in the country. There's a lot of tension. Those are the only two number ones I want to be, <laughs> Tim. That's it. Just to, it's, it's a modest, it's, it's a modest yeah. proposition. Yeah, I'm, that's an easy one. Uh, but there's a lot of tension between those two indus industries. Right. Can you have it both ways? Um, I, we're dedicated to the proposition that the two industries can coexist successfully, right? Uh, but that will require do, a do, whole lot of... Do fishermen feel that way? So what I think, so I will say, so the fishing industry... Uh, isn't monolithic, right? There are many fishing industries, many ports, many different vessel types and gear types, right? So in general, the fishermen in New Bedford, right? New Bedford's the center of it all on the East Coast, uh, I think are ambivalent about it. They're concerned about how it'll play out and whether wind farms will be placed in, uh, in sensitive habitat areas for things like cod and scallops. Uh, they're concerned about the navigational hazards, and if you're, you know, you're a fisherman, you're, a, you're in the industry with, with America's highest mm -hmm. occupational mortality rate. Right? It's, it's a dangerous business, mm -hmm. and you got to be careful. These are all really legitimate concerns that we've worked hard to get the wind developers, especially the Europeans who aren't familiar with the fishing industry in the United States, to understand and to accommodate. But that's that's a work in progress. What I what I will say is that uh, fishermen, so fishermen are trepidatious on the one hand about it, at least the ones in New Bedford. On the other hand, um, they're from New Bedford and they want to see New Bedford do well and they, they see the prospects of offshore wind and they say like there's, there are going to be companies investing a lot of dough in New Bedford and employing a lot of people and, um, and so I think they're, they're taking more of a wait and see approach. Now fishermen outside of New Bedford are probably a little less um, uh, open-minded about it. We've had some. Uh, there's there's been some. You know, pardon the pardon the uh, the metaphor, but some rough waters there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think as, as as things start to play out, and there's a little more predictability, then I, I, people will understand. Okay, this area is for offshore wind. This this is um, you know this is for fishing, and and I think we'll be able to see. You know um, you know. Th things become a little more copacetic. I want to ask you, uh, we, we were just talking about the new governor, more hailing her visit. I want to talk about the just outgoing governor, uh, Charlie yep. Baker, who obviously just finished up uh, his term, which is why more Healy was down here. You know, we always talk about southeastern Massachusetts being overlooked, and yet I know <clears throat> Baker's team would say, wait a minute, <laughs> we got South Coast Rail done. I wouldn't say we overlooked southeastern Massachusetts. When you, you know, weigh in the balance how Governor Baker was for this region and look at his eight years, what do you, what's, your, what's your verdict? Yeah, so uh, on, on balance positive, right? there was a lot of investment. Um, he committed a lot of investment to, uh, to the city and to the region. You know, the rail uh, project was certainly one of them, probably the highest profile of all the infrastructure projects uh, in the region. But, um, they, but they also invested a lot in port infrastructure, which is you know, a huge priority of mine for reasons that we just discussed, um, and in uh, a number of other things along the way. You know, we're getting a new airport terminal, so that, that's, that's a major investment. There are a number of other um, investments that will, in the long run, for decades ahead, prove to be very beneficial. Uh, it took a while uh, to get there. I think you know, one of the struggles that historically the region has had is just the lack of familiarity of folks who are in in office in in Boston, and this is there is a uh, there is a little bit of a blind spot uh, on on their part. Republican and Democratic administration. I mean, it's like been I, well, who was the last constitutional officer to come from this region? I, you stumped me. Yeah, exactly. I can't think of one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but my point only is it. Um, much to their credit, and I think a lot of this has to do with Karen Polito, uh, who now lives down here. Right. Uh, they they started to familiarize themselves with, it, and they understood that we were a group that could they could work with and get a lot of important projects done. They started to appreciate our interests, and they they backed it up with money. And and so that that I, I so I think the, his legacy will be a very positive one as a result. So you just need to make sure every lieutenant governor buys a summer home in Dartmouth, uh, as Polito did. That, and then you'll be all that set. Helps. We want them to drink our Kool Aid. That's yeah. Right. Right, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, it'll start investing with us. All right, our guest this week is New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell. We're going to take a break. When we come back, the mayor has a big decision to make. Will he run again? Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell. Mayor, uh, you were first elected in 2011. Are you going to run again for re-election? Yeah. Well, as we said off there, it just seems like an awfully long time ago, Tim. <laughs> yeah. I, had no, I, had, I had no idea I would be in it, you know, some, you know, now 11 plus years later. And um, so uh, in years past, in election se seasons past, I've, I've, you know, announced my decisions closer to the summertime. I'm not saying I'm going to do that this time around. Uh, I can tell you I have not decided yet. Um, you really haven't? You're just not saying it? No, I really haven't. I'm torn. So here's how I frame well, it, right? Well, let's give you yeah, a pause. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you. So the, the, it's hard to walk away from something you really like, right? It's something, hard to walk away from something that, that you find gratifying, um, and, and especially if that's a, if it is, if you're like you guys, uh, if something has to do with serving the public and that's the thing that, that energizes you, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say right, enough's enough, right? If it's your, your, your life's goal is to, you know, help other people. On the other hand, we've set out, we've done, I'd like to think, what we set out to do, right? I set out to lower the unemployment rate in New Bedford when I started out. It was 13% when I got in. It's, it's under 5% now. We set out to improve the graduation rate in, uh, in the city, right? It went from 58% at New Bedford High, now it's 88%, right? It's probably one of the biggest jumps out of any major urban high school in the country. Um, crime has dropped more than 35% in the city, right? It's a much, much safer city now. And we're seeing uh, sort of the strategic development now of the Port of New Bedford, which is the bread and butter of the whole region, right? So these, there's something to be said, not only for like leaving the stage while people are still clapping, right? <laughs> but, um, but also like you don't, I, I don't, I didn't set out to do this job just to perpetuate myself in office. I think a lot of office holders do that. So um, that's how I framed the decision. I haven't settled on, <laughs> I settled it in my mind. And, you know, it's obviously something that these are indeed family decisions. And then, so this is some, an ongoing discussion with my family um, and those who are close to me, those who've been committed to uh, the work that we've, uh, we've been doing. So I don't take it lightly. Um, but that's, that's, that's how I. So I, you I might, so you mind. might not decide till summer? Announce? Um, maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> all right. So uh, this is, all this all this talk is really raising my blood pressure. It's, it's, it's <laughs> clearly, yeah. we get that a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's our job. <laughs> that's your job. Yeah, yes. That's right. uh, I will speak. say. So you probably want. Yeah, no, it's it it's tough. You know, we, it's so the being mayor is very different from serving in other uh, elected capacities, right? And there is a there is an intimacy with the mm -hmm. those oh, yeah. you serve that is different from being a legislator, even different from being a governor, right? You. You know, you go to the funerals and the wakes, and, and, you, and you, you're there when people need you, right? The storms that you guys, you know, the, the station depicts on TV, and all, all and it says you have to be there and, like, be it to have people's backs. And that's, um, and it's, it's hard to sort of sever yourself um, from that. Now, there was a time for people to move on, too, right? Like, <laughs> you want to outlast your stay, and you want to be productive, you want to be energized and really, you know, committed to the work, but, and, and I am. but. So that, well, that's kind of hard. That's cool. I, I looked it up I'm, yesterday. I, I'm, I'm just laying all this out. I'm just burying myself. Yeah, wow. Yeah, right, 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 right. I looked it up yesterday. So yeah. Mayor Ashley served for 32 years, which would be 2043 for you. You don't think you'll? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not shooting for any records. Yeah, all right. You're not going to yeah, break his. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, there's been a, a controversy in your city about uh, pay raises. Um, in December, the city council approved salary increases for city department heads and other non-union specialized jobs that were quite impressive, some 60% raise. I read that the animal control yeah. officer's pay raise would go from 82 grand a year to 120,000. Right. HR. In other words, the dog catcher would make more than the mayor. That's right. <laughs> HR uh, would have gone from 93 grand to $143,000. You know, sign me up. But amid public outcry, the city council made an about face. We're taping this on a Friday last night. Right. Uh, and they capped those raises at 25%. Still a good hike. But did you support the original Pay raises? Well, it was my proposal, right? So, so, so understand. So, what we went through was an exercise that cities have to go through from time to time, and these days even more frequently. And that is, you got to look at um, the salaries of, of city managers, right, non-union employees, to determine whether you're competitive for uh, in, the, in the market for, for managers, right? So, right now we've got a big problem, right? So, the Great Resignation did not spare municipal government. So, we have in a city that has about 1,300 non-school uh, employees, we've got over 200 vacancies. And we've got some vacancies in some very sensitive areas. 
We haven't had a CFO in two years. We've, uh, we haven't had an assessor in six months. Uh, we haven't had a treasurer in a number of months. And these are positions that we've tried to fill, but we haven't, right? So, But are we so, seeing other cities give 60% proposed raises to try and deal with well, that? Just, I mean, just, just merely for the record, I didn't propose any 60% increase. So, that, so understand there was a two-step process. We went out and did a study, right, that looked at comps. What's Providence paying? What's Fall River paying? What's Brockton paying? What's Springfield paying for like positions? And what we try to achieve is if we want to be competitive in the market, right, because, you know, mediocrity, right, be getting mediocre candidates in, in poor positions is itself expensive, right? The public deserves to have qualified people running whatever in city government. But at the same time, you know, we want to make sure there's some horizontal equity in, in the, uh, the organization. So we went through that study, and cities do that. Providence does it. Boston just finished theirs um, and proposed to the city council, this is what we think we need to be competitive. And what it worked out to be is roughly uh, across the board about a 10% raise. The city council uh, got a hold of it and started to goose up certain positions, right, for people they liked, right? They're focusing on people and not on the positions, right? It's not giving, elevating salaries isn't for, to my mind, shouldn't be about deservedness, at least not in this circumstance. There's way, ways of, of, of um, rewarding uh, good performance. But when you're raising a whole salary scale, it's all about the positions. And when the city, city council proposed raising uh, the positions that, uh, the salaries for the positions that you just mentioned, um, unconscionably. Um, and so that, that's what, what the, where the public backlash came in. They fixed some of it in last night's city council meeting in response to that backlash. I still think there's probably some reining in that has to be done, and we'll take a look at, at it when the dust settles and we'll propose. So you're not ready to sign it? I, I've got to, I, I have to sign it. I have to sign it because we, we, we can't, we're, we're struggling to hire people right now. This is the big challenge of city government right now, just the, the vacancies. At some point, you can only you know, put your finger in, in, in the dike so many times, and, and I'm especially concerned about the financial management and city government. Um, that's a struggle, and so I will sign it and because we've got to get back out on the market and try to hire a CFO, uh, a treasurer, uh, an assessor, because those, those positions, we have interim folks in there. We have retirees serving in those positions now on an interim basis, and that's, that's not good for the long run. Uh, nobody's been writing about New Bedford politics longer than Jack Spillane, who's now at the New Bedford Light. And he had an eyebrow-raising column the other day that reported the new city council president, Linda Murad, hasn't spoken to you in nearly two years. Yeah. Um, I did call Murad myself earlier this week to, to chat with her about why she did not call me back, so I can't explain uh, why she says she, she's not speaking to the mayor. So but you, you, you shouldn't take it personally. Though. Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's perhaps a theme. But, uh, you know, j jokes aside, and I know you, know you beat her, we should tell people in the mayor's race way back in, in 2011. I don't know if that's why she's still sore at you or whatnot. But uh, frankly, personality aside, how are you going to deal with a right. city council if the president won't talk to you? Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, yeah, it's been almost two years since we had an exchange. Um, since that- Did piece, something happen? Like, was the exchange you said, like, I hate you, you suck? Like, what, what happened? No, there was, there was, there was no ra break? Radio, radio silence. And again, you know, tried to reach out, radio silence still. Um, it's not a good arrangement, um, and um, I mean, you know how it is. Like someone stops returning your phone calls, it's like, what do you do then, right? After, after several attempts, um, I, I did after uh, just re after that piece came out, um, we did have an ex a text exchange. So oh, I hope there's a little thawing mm. out there, but it's not. Uh, I think we've got to ultimately do better than than that, and so I'm certainly open to. Um, uh, I really would like to have you know an, an, an engaging dialogue with with her about all the important matters um, going on in, in the city, and so you know I stand ready to, to, to be you know to take her calls and to you know to to uh, and I'll keep trying. That's I guess all I can say. Uh, we unfortunately it is weird. I like to, to talk about you know, talk about that, but it's like you can only try so many times to, to reach out to somebody, and the response you got is kind of the response that mm -hmm. I got, which is nothing. Uh, unfortunately, we only have uh, less than two minutes now, and this topic could, could take up 15. But I, I do have to ask about it. Your pick to be the Greater New Bedford Voc Tech uh, you know, committee person was, was voted down by the city council earlier this month. The issue seems to be over school admission policy, whether it should be pivot from a selective process like it, uh, like it is now to a lottery. 
do you think the admissions policy needs to change? There? Absolutely, yeah. It's it's unfortunate. We could spend a lot of time on it because yeah. it is a complex subject. But the the bottom line is that that um, uh, New Bedford Volk, which is a school for which I, I'm very fond of, and many family members attend there over, over the years. Uh, uh, in, in effect, uh, discriminates against kids who are uh, whose first language is in English. Um, they're, they're, and so they're intentionally not selecting those students, is what you're saying. They are selecting students based on academic achievement, and that's not the the, the role of a vocational school, right? It should it should be more neutral, and uh, um, and they have to they have to change quickly because you know we're we're seeing a whole generation of students. Uh, whose first language is not English being left behind. Right now, and this is the sort of the most telling fact, right now in New Bedford High School, 30% uh, of the students are English language learners, and New Bedford Volk only 4%. And that is a, an enormous disparity, one that any civil rights lawyer would say, well, that's a layup of a lawsuit, and we don't want to put Volk Tech in that position, but they're putting the, or allow Volk Tech to get into that position where they're having to defend something that's undefendable. Um, and so I, my hope is that either the board uh, or the state will finally say, you know what, we've got to go to a lottery because that's the only fair way to allow kids into the school. All right. Uh, New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell, thank you very much for being on the program. Great and we'll to be with you guys. Look forward to seeing what your decision is. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. Mm -hmm.